give your presentation. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, thank you for the invitation to speak to the group today. I uh, very much appreciate that. And hopefully give you a little bit of insight into what Madison Chemical does, uh, how we approach the product formulation, and specifically how we deal with some of the environmental aspects and significant aspects of our ISO 14001 system when we're looking at ways to um, make uh, cleaner, greener formulations. Um, I'm the technical director at Madison Chemical. I've been there about five and a half years now. And as you can probably tell from my accent, I was uh, born and educated in the United Kingdom and uh, spent the last 13 years or so working in the US in various capacities, always related to chemicals and often quite close to surfactants. That's something I've studied a lot during my career. Um, just to give you an overview of the presentation itself, actually, if I make this the full, there we go, maybe that'll work better. Okay, so the contents, um, just a brief introduction to Madison Chemical. Um, something about hard surface cleaning. So I'll talk about the product lines that we have and then go into the detail a little bit more on an alkaline cleaning formulation as an example. Now, related to that example, there are gonna be certain environmental challenges that uh, I'll speak about in a bit more detail. I'm gonna focus mostly on non-alphenol non epoxylate surfactants, uh, VOCs and respirable dust, ways to mitigate the use of those chemicals or eliminate them if possible. Uh, I think no discussion of business practices in 2020 would be complete without some reference to the COVID-19 pandemic. So I was just going to mention some of the arrangements that we've made uh, to try to, to deal with that as best we can. And then I'll just summarize the discussion briefly at the end. Um, Madison Chemical was actually founded as far back as 1947. Uh, the intention was to supply cleaning chemicals and various other products to the food industry. The facility that Mark visited a couple of years ago was actually founded in 1959. And again, the focus initially was on, on the food industry for cleaning products. Uh, in the 60s, they got into some of the metal paint pretreatment type products. Um, there have been some acquisitions of other chemical companies and product lines along the way. Uh, various additions and improvements to the facility. Um, that kind of brings us up to the early 90s when the ISO 9001 program was started. Joined uh, the Partners for Pollution Program in 19, or Pollution Prevention Program in 96. Uh, we got ISO 14001 in 2001. Then we kind of move on into the 2010s where we began our NPE phase out program. Um, VOC reduction efforts also began in about the middle of the last decade and then uh, this decade and then um, we joined ESP in 2018. And right now, the main projects are to increase uh, our storage capacity. There, there are plans afoot to expand our warehousing, for example. So the company continues to grow. Um, I think right now, sales are probably somewhere around the 30 million a year mark. And it's grown considerably in the last few years, even since I've been with the company. So it's a fairly dynamic company with ambitions to, to grow and to um, increase its market penetration. We look at the, the distribution map quickly. Uh, of course, we're centered in Indiana, uh, in Madison, right there on the border of Kentucky. But we have um, pretty much coast to coast coverage. Uh, we've got some remote manufacturing locations strategically positioned around the country and also warehousing in, in certain areas too. So, um, so the company continues to grow. And I think before long, pretty much every state will have a green star in it. We uh, serve a number of different markets. And when we look at our business activities in general, um, we, we try to leverage the, the best practices and knowledge from, from the different uh, customers that we serve. So as I mentioned, food, cleaning, and sanitation were really the, the core focus from the very beginning. Uh, the metal uh, pretreatment type products have, have been also uh, made by Madison for decades. And we serve certain niche markets too. So we sell chemicals to paper mills. Um, we, we also are involved in um, the printing industry. And there are one or two other bits and pieces too. So dairies, egg farms, um, bits and pieces like that. So pretty much anywhere where 
hard surface cleaning is a necessity, we typically have an option that we can offer. And um, based on the experience we have in the lab, um, the sales force and the ownership, it's third generation family owned, so there's continuity in everything that we do. Um, we can normally come up with a customized solution to pretty much any cleaning problem. So Mark mentioned some of the uh, awards for environmental stewardship that Madison Chemicals received over the years. Um, it says eight on here. I think we might actually be missing one or two, but I'll blame Matt on the corporate people that put this slide together. We do hold a few patents, uh, cleaning products, cleaning formulations. Of late, as the company's been in a growth phase, we've been probably creating at least 30 new products a year, certainly in the last five years or so. And we also sell equipment to allow people to apply the cleaning or sanitation products. And again, we tend to work um, with, with an, we have an engineering group and they will design uh, a customized uh, product delivery system if needed. Some of it's off the shelf equipment, but pretty much whatever the customer needs, we will work with them to, to, to make it happen for them. And with my background, um, and I've worked in places where basically everything that moved was patented. So I can understand that you know, with a smaller company that might not be quite the approach, but I've been impressed with Madison's willingness to at least to you know, protect some of the core technology to the extent that's possible. I think we'll continue to try to do that. Um, just on the certification and awards side of thing again, um, Mark mentioned some of the governor's awards that we've received. We joined ESP in um, November of 2018. We've got the certificate there. And we have ISO 14001 and 9001 certifications. They're just about in the process of being renewed. Uh, we had a recertification audit in the past few months. Sustainability is very important to us, uh, partly because of the type of customers that we serve and we share their philosophy there. Um, and we're very, in, I think we're a pretty environmentally conscious company. As mentioned, we joined the environmental stewardship program. Um, one example of the VOC reduction efforts, there, there's an engine remanufacturing customer that we have. And over the years, we've been able to help them get their VOC usage, usage down by around 90%. Um, we get through a tremendous amount of containers, large and small, um, wherever humanly possible, those are reconditioned or reused. Um, and we've worked with our, our paper industry customers, um, specifically on projects where we're working to reduce the, the energy intensiveness of some of the, um, the processes that they use. And again, that's resulted from you know, collaborative efforts to come up with the most effective cleaning solution to save them time energy and money, of course, in the process. And just got a few pictures here on, on the left-hand side of the slide where you can see one aspect of our, of our warehouse, and that's when we had uh, Julia Wickard was actually in the picture during the uh, inspection visit that was made prior to our ESP membership acceptance. So if we move on to um, some of the hard surface cleaning aspects of the presentation, I was just gonna go over some of our product lines uh, break down an alkaline cleaning formulation, talk about the environmental challenges associated with that formulation effort, product and process improvements that we've made, um, again, from the environmental side mostly, we'll deal with COVID and then wrap it up at the end. So Madison Chemical um, specializes in formulating hard surface cleaning products. And we also, in this day and age, it's very important we uh, formulate and resell third party sanitizing products, EPA registered products. So our main product lines include, but I'm not limited to alkaline cleaners. I mean, one example would be a product we call ProClean Foam. That's sold in large amounts to mainly uh, food processing facilities for cleaning stainless steel or other, other surfaces where food is, food is prepared. Acidic cleaners, uh, an example I picked out here, CIP 300X. Uh, again, that's just um, a strong acid cleaning solution for descaling. Uh, again, could, could be used by, by food manufacturers, could be used by more industrial customers. We do some solvent-based cleaners, but not a tremendous amount. Um, compound SME 937 is actually a soy methyl ester-based product. Uh, relatively low VOC per the manufacturer's declaration which we found application for in some of our customers who would like to reduce their overall VOC reporting burden. Right now, um, 
we've got about 90% liquid, 10% dry powder products. Um, that the breakdown is probably shifting more and more towards liquids. Dry powder formulations probably will never quite go away because they do offer advantages of cost. They're generally pretty cheap compared with the liquids. And transportation is arguably more efficient when you're transporting something that's 100% actives rather than a, a liquid product that might be 30, 40% active. So what we want to do is um, basically get the customer what they want. Uh, we're not a big enough company that we can just say, here's our off the shelf recommendation for this application. You know, kind of take it or leave it. We will work with customers to figure out exactly what they need and you know, modify formulations or generate something completely new based on what they need and what they want. Um, and to that end, we continually research raw materials, um, processing methods, regulatory um, limitations or, or exemptions, dependingly. We will try to look at all angles, really, of a, formulating a product for a customer to make sure they get what they need, uh, a good value product that works, but also is as environmentally friendly and presents them with a the minimum reporting burden that we can possibly manage. So if we take a look here at this, this is just a very generic overview of an alkaline cleaner. So there's gonna be a carrier or like the, the, the base medium that it's in. So for water-based product, we'll typically use deionized water. Sometimes soft water is acceptable, but increasingly we use DI and we've got a large on-site DI um, generating system to, to take care of that for us. Typically for a dry powdered product, soda ash is the most common carrier. It will have some effect um, as alkaline, so it will add to the alkaline cleaning effect. But uh, typically, there'll be a specific alkali added for degreasing or, or general <clears throat> soil removal. And in the water-based products, we'll usually use liquid sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide for that purpose. And in the dry powdered formulations, it's normally caustic soda beads that would be the, the main alkali that would give the, the cleaner its, its real punch, its real power. We need to use builders, as we call them, to condition the water and improve detergent performance. Now, typically that's to control hard water ions like calcium or magnesium. I mean, traditionally and typically phosphates, silicates or carbonates tend to be used. And depending on the end use, um, the choice of the builders will be, will be based upon that. Um, if a customer has restrictions on how much phosphorus they could discharge, well, we would probably avoid phosphates and maybe look at silicates or carbonates or perhaps some specialty additive. Um, silicates do have the benefit, though, of protecting soft metal attack um, from the caustic, the caustic components in the cleaning chemicals. So many of our products have a balance between caustic soda or caustic potash and, and, and silicate um, so that while you've got the cleaning power, you're not gonna destroy aluminum components, for example. We avoid hard chelates like EDTA um, for various reasons. Um, it would cause us problems with our own wastewater management system. And some of our customers have specified over the years that they won't accept EDTA in their products. So we'll just use you know, alternatives to, to condition the water and um, get the most out of the surfactants or detergents in the system. So the surfactants or detergents, I mean, primarily they um, remove uh, soils from surfaces and keep them away from redepositing on the surface. Um, the number of surfactants out there on the market is, is mind boggling. It, it takes a critical eye to really pick out the best ones for any particular application. And um, there are some proven workhorses out there. There are some new and interesting technologies available, but uh, we, we keep to a reasonable number that we know work and meet our various criteria, both performance and, and environmental. Um, solvents can be added to some of these water-based products, not so much the dry powders, but um, the, uh, the downside of that, of course, it could be introduced, introducing VOC to a product that would otherwise be zero VOC. So if we do need solvents in a product, uh, we'll try to use the minimum amount and try to use low VOC options wherever they're possible. Um, and then another feature of an alkaline cleaner, typically, as I mentioned, silicate may be in there anyway um, as, a, as a builder, but the um, corrosion inhibitors 
sometimes there are specialty additives. I mean, there are various um, azole-based chemistries for yellow metal uh, corrosion inhibition. Uh, we sometimes run into zinc or galvanized parts, and we need to give those special consideration as well. So this is just a very general picture of uh, what can very quickly become complex and uh, you know, quite, quite a task to manage all the different aspects of the formulation to, to meet all the needs. So just a, a quick comment on some of the environmental challenges we face when putting a, pr a product together and how we, we deal with uh, the manufacture of it. So we have the ISO 14001 system, as I mentioned, and that tends to guide a lot of our operational environmental health and safety considerations. So in terms of infrastructure, we actually have an on-site wastewater treatment system. So that's a combination of pH adjustment and biological processes. So we have to be careful what we, we can adjust pH easily enough, but we have to be a bit careful about what goes in the system so it doesn't destroy the biological side of it. So sanitizing products, for example, cannot under any circumstances enter the, the wastewater system. They have to be, any rinse water has to be captured and reused or otherwise disposed of. The entire facility, wherever chemicals are handled, is basically designed as a containment area. So should something be spilled, whether from a, a drum or a tote of raw material or from one of the mixing tanks, uh, it can be captured and then we have complete control over where it goes next, which is a very handy feature and um, gives us you know, a fair degree of surety that we're not going to be losing anything to the outside world, except in some perhaps very extreme circumstances. The mixing vessels where we blend the liquid products, they have localized dust collectors and we have a ribbon blender for, for dry powder products that that includes an upgraded dust collector that was actually installed after, after the ESP inspection. Um, so Mark probably wouldn't have seen that one when he was there on site. Uh, in terms of chemicals, we've got around 1500 active products, finished goods, um, and around 600 or so active raw materials. And of course to handle just that, we've got a fairly significant and sophisticated chemical management system So in terms of product and process improvements that we want to make with, with an environmental angle, um, I was going to talk in a bit more detail about NPE surfactant replacements, VOC management, and respirable dust reduction in our operations. Now, all three of these relate to specific ISO 14001 aspects and compliance obligations. So the things I've picked are not just random, they tie into our um, whole ISO management system and our legal requirements as well. So just to begin with the NPE surfactant replacement, um, I'll talk about the surfactants themselves, our current usage, replacement strategies, um, alternatives to NPEs and, and some conclusions. So sometimes known as just NP or NPEs, uh, non-ile phenols or non-ile phenol epoxalates, um, they're non-ionic surfactants. Um, and they're used in a plethora of applications they have a number of advantages to a formulator in that they're cheap, uh, they're readily available, and they're very effective. I mean, over the years, they've been used in massive amounts because simply because they work so well. Um, the problem is, though, that uh, their widespread use tends to lead to their entry into the aquatic environment, and uh, they are, they're toxic to aquatic life, which, of course, is a major problem. Um, now, there, I've, I cited a couple, well, three um, aspects here where EPA have got and a non-alphenol or non-alphenol ethoxylate action plan. Uh, there was a significant new use rule in 2014. And then for reports submitted 2020 onwards, uh, NPE surfactants became Sarah 13, 313 reportable for reporting year 2019, I suppose I should say. But this year we filed our first 313 report that included NPE surfactant use. So right now, Madison Chemical only uses three NPEs. Um, there are no restrictions on the ones we use, particularly they're, they're uh, not prohibited from industrial applications. They're not named in the 2014 significant new use restriction. Um, they're all the same cast number. Uh, it's all a four non alphenol branched ethoxylated surfactant. And NPE6, NPE9, and NPE12, the, the numbers just refer to the degrees of ethoxylation. So, where we have the, um, the, the, this, this little chemical grouping here, this would either be six, nine, or 12 of these groups that would um, 
indicate which NPE surfactant that you are actually using. In terms of water solubility, as the number increases, they become more water soluble or less oil-like, which is important from a formulation perspective and also has you know, some, some effect on how, how uh, water soluble they're going to be and how easy they are to, to handle should they reach the, uh, the outside world. So I tried to put together uh, at least an overview of Madison Chemicals NPE surfactant use over the last five years or so. So we tend to use NPE 9 in the largest amounts, uh, followed by NPE 12 and then NPE 6. Um, so then that's aggregated. So we're still using around 35,000 pounds a year of, of NPEs in total. Um, but I'll try to put that in a bit of context because as I mentioned earlier on, the company's in a fairly significant growth phase right now. And as you can see, in 2014, we manufactured around 20 million pounds of product total. Bring it fast forward to the end of 2019, um, that had gone up to you know, over 22 and a half million pounds. So we're making more product. Uh, and if you look at the orange line, that's the NPE as a percentage of total pounds of product manufactured. So we are on a general downward curve. Um, you know, the targets to get that curve to come down more as, as we go forward. Um, and to that end, uh, we do have an NPE replacement strategy. So since NPE 9 was the most commonly used of fact, and that's the one we've been focusing on, and um, even probably just before I joined the company, there were already efforts to um, find alternatives to the NPE 9. Uh, a number of industry proven alternatives were examined and we still continue to do that. We're in constant touch with a, a large number of surfactant vendors, either directly or through their distributors. Uh, the NPE 12 and 6 um, were used in lesser amounts historically. Uh, so perhaps we're not such a high priority, but they're very much in our sights now to begin to, to replace or at least minimize their use. And one way that I like to drive this, and we've done this every year since I've been with the company, is to make the uh, NPE replacement project one of our annual ISO objectives. That makes sure it gets plenty of exposure to senior management, and it helps to just quantify the whole effort, and uh, we can apply some smart thinking to it. Um, so for this year, we had another 66 products, uh, mostly with NPE 12 or 6 that we were working on. Um, 24 have been completed. Um, I've got a number more that are pending completion. So I think by the end of this year, we may end up getting through maybe three quarters of our list. And I think then the objective will just roll over into 2021 and we'll keep on working down and, and eventually try to get them all taken care of. So alternatives to NPEs, um, for the most part, alcohol or phoxylate surfactants are, are very commonly marketed. Um, there's, uh, th there are some offsets listed by the, uh, by the EPA as well. Um, as I mentioned, a very wide range of commercially available options. Um, there's always someone willing to sell you an NPE offset uh, if you're willing to pay, pay for it. Now, there, as I mentioned, there is a cost to eliminate NPEs. Um, they're commoditized, they're low cost, they've been on the market for a long, long time. So any offset is going to have to try to compete with that. Some, uh, some of our vendors claim that the NPE replacements are actually more effective. Therefore, you don't need to be one to one. You might be 0.5 or 0.75 to one with the replacement versus the NPE. One downside, of course, is that the alternatives are almost always more expensive pound for pound. So, you know, some formulation tweaks may allow you to save some money if you can use less of the replacement than the NPE itself. Things like product stability have to be uh, carefully considered because non-ionic surfactants typically have a cloud point. So you have to make sure the cloud point matches the uh, incumbent NPE surfactant. And that simply means if the product gets heated to a certain temperature, it will become cloudy. Uh, that helps with um, foam control in certain applications, but it can be a problem in transit or in storage if the, uh, the chemical or the finished product encounters higher temperatures than normal. So we just have to be careful that we're um, <clears throat> not creating ourselves another problem by replacing the NPE and then having a product that is apparently unstable when it arrives at the customer. Cleaning efficacy or efficiency, um, that's one thing that usually needs to be tested 
in the field to be absolutely sure that the replacement surfactants doing the same job or sometimes even a better job. We look at things like the, um, the HLB uh, value of the surfactant, um, make sure that that is in the same ballpark as the NPE surfactant. And we have to make sure that the other alkaline, acidic or solvent system is going to be compatible with the replacement surfactant. So we looked at NPE 9 first. Um, so since 2016, we've replaced NPEs in 112 products, which is a large proportion of, of the affected products. Um, for the most part, we use a CL, uh, an 11 carbon alcohol ethoxylate that's got seven moles of ethylene oxide. They worked pretty well. Um, many cases, it's a straight drop in. Sometimes we need to make some adjustments. We may need to add extra hydrotrope or we may need to slightly modify alkalinity or acidity, whatever, whatever is perhaps causing a compatibility problem. We do occasionally run into some of our products that don't tend to accept the alcohol ethoxylate very well. And in those cases, we'll just continue with the NPE until we can research more or one of our suppliers can come up with a solution too. We very much um, consider our suppliers as part of the team. It's not just what happens within the four walls of Madison Chemical that necessarily gets these problems solved. The C11 alcohol ethoxylate that we use is on the EPA safer chemical ingredients list, which um, is, is obviously encouraging and it's the kind of thing we'll share with our customers just to reassure them that we're trying to you know, look out for everybody's best interests. As I mentioned earlier, the NPE 12, um, we haven't been working on that as much. We've replaced the NPE 12 in 19 products so far. Um, and late last year, we had um, a breakthrough really where a new alcohol ethoxylate offset was approved. The NPE 6, um, we're really still just getting started on that. We've got one or two solvent based products where the NPE 6 is probably more comfortable from a formulation perspective. Um, we have an offset though, again, we approved in uh, late last year. so. It's really just working through the products and working with customers to get the NPE 6 and 12 replacement uh, projects up and running in a big way. Just wanted to mention one, one case study. Uh, we had one Indiana based customer. Um, I think they got a bit of a shock when they had to report 1,473 pounds of NPE use in 2019. So we immediately went to work with them to um, start to replace the NPEs. It's only five products, but they use a lot of those products. So uh, there were four water-based cleaning products and one solvent-based formulation. Um, we should be completing that project by the end of this year. Uh, and that should then bring their reportable NPE close to zero. I can only speak for the products we sell them, of course, if they, if they buy anything from a different vendor, then that's uh, you know, a conversation I'm not gonna be involved in. But our contribution to this, I think, is effectively to eliminate their need to report NPEs. So just a couple of thoughts on, on, on that NPE replacement effort. Um, you can't necessarily guarantee one-to-one -one replacement uh, will be available for NPE. Uh, the functionality of the NPE may or may not be completely replaceable by alternatives. There's usually a cost penalty and you know, some reformulation may be necessary. But I think in terms of reducing the, the regulatory reporting burden, um, it, it definitely, for us as a vendor, goes a, a long way towards you know, um, showing our value to our customers and, and, and demonstrating to them that we, we, we take regulatory compliance very seriously. And we're always willing to help them with whatever adjustments they need. So, Moving on to VOC management, again, I was going to discuss the VOC sources that we have right now, our usage, how to reduce or eliminate VOCs, VOC alternatives, and just a few conclusions at the end. So VOC, um, along with, uh, with NOx, uh, stratospheric ozone precursors, I think most people are aware, um, you know, ozone depletion has not necessarily done the planet much good um, in, in the industrial age and uh, anything that can be done to try to minimize those pollutants has, has, has got to be a positive. Um, now for us and for the industry, industry in general, I mean VOC, so, VOC sources include things like solvents, could be glycol ethers, could be pretty much anything that's not on the EPA exempt list. Uh, hydrocarbon solvents of course, alcohols, volatile amines, 
even small contributions from some of the surfactants, typically from solvents that are contained in the surfactant. Um, right now, a couple of glycol ethers account for about 50% of all of our VOC use. Um, now, I should mention that any VOC containing raw materials that we have are stored securely in closed containers within a building. So the, the potential for release is, is extremely small, but um, we've taken the precautions that we can to, uh, to secure those materials. So if we look at the, the usage over the last five years of those two glycol ethers, um, again, I've shown this uh, both in terms of um, well, pounds of product produced or sold and the percentage of VOC as a, as a percent, as a, as a relative quantity. So over the last five years, as I mentioned, our pounds produced or sold has gone up a lot. Um, the VOC has bounced around a bit. I mean, we reached a high in 2015 and we've come down below that now. Again, would like to see that curve continue to drop as we, as we go forward. But uh, I think our efforts are beginning to bear fruit. So since we, we do get through a good amount of VOC containing glycol ethers, and now that's for a variety of products. It could be hard surface cleaning for food or metal customers. Uh, we use a fair bit of glycol ether with some of our ink cleaning activities and some of the paper mills also take some solvent based products. Uh, it's unlikely that we're just gonna be able to knock that number down um, in a very short space of time. So what we've tended to do is focus on specific customers, specific applications, um, areas where we can help people with, with their particular problems. Now, some people may or may not have a VOC reporting issue. They may have some kind of VOC recapture system. Um, our position is we want to offer the lowest VOC products we can that will do the job and are allowed by regulation. So we've worked with certain customers to understand you know, what their restrictions are, um, how, how they're regulated, how they report. And that tends to influence some of our formulation decisions. Now, of course, zero VOC may not be a necessity. For example, some solvent degreasing operations, and I've cited one of the, um, the Indiana statutes here that applies to one of our customers. Um, I think if you're less than 1% VOC, well, then you don't need to, to report that. 1% um, VOC in the product, I mean. So we work with um, you know, one of the customers to help get their VOC well down um, by simply switching to a solvent-based system with, with less than 1% reportable VOC. That involved a uh, fairly extensive project, of course, to make sure that the, the revised product or the new product would do the job they needed it to do. And uh, there was a fair bit of fact checking on, on all of the regulatory aspects. When we look at VOC alternatives, um, of course, there's the US EPA list. Um, now, some jurisdictions, some states, maybe parts of California, we run into New York State are changing some rules on VOC. Um, a number of different places have got a different outlook on, on air pollutants. Um, the problem with most of the stuff on the EPA list is that solvents like acetone might do a great job of dissolving some soil but they're highly flammable and not really compatible with, with our, um, our product base. And really, we don't want to handle flammable chemicals and that's absolutely unavoidable. Um, the other aspect is that some of the um, non-flammable VOC options on the EPA list are often a lot more expensive than things like glycol ethers, for example, which have become heavily commoditized over the years. Um, so, so an example here, soy methyl esters, as, as I mentioned already, some of these are marketed or certified to have less than 1% VOC. And we've had some success replacing 100% VOC hydrocarbon solvents with, with soy methyl ester. Um, another strategic approach to, to VOC avoidance is just simply to use a water-based cleaning product with minimal or no solvent content whatsoever. Now that may or may not work in every case. Of course, some soils are gonna be much more amenable to solvents than to a water-based system, but alkalinity can, to a degree, compensate for the, the lack of solvent action in, in a cleaning product. So, as, as I've mentioned already, the ubiquity, um, and the, the, the fact that uh, glycol ethers are extremely cheap, relatively speaking, and hydrocarbons probably even cheaper still, um, 
we've got to be realistic. I don't think it's likely that we're going to be able to eliminate them completely. And I think that's just um, a Madison chemical perspective, but I think it's just a realistic view of the, the world in general. Um, many other companies make hard surface cleaning products similar to Madison chemical. And from you know, my knowledge of them, they all use some level of solvent somewhere along the line. Um, there are low or zero VOC options. Um, and we've had some success working with customers case by case to at least try to chip away at the, the problem and the amount of VOC that, uh, that they use. So then the third category I was going to discuss uh, respirable dust reduction. So again, I'll consider the sources, how much we're using, how we might reduce or eliminate alternatives to high dust uh, raw materials and conclusions. So right now, um, we use a variety of raw materials that, uh, that can generate dust. So surfactants, now uh, dispersants also, um, they, they quite often, um, they're, they're polymeric materials that are sold as a dry powder, often with extremely small particle size. We use uh, a fair amount of abrasive. We make industrial lapping products. So things like silicon carbide, alumina, we have used more exotic um, abrasives like boron carbide as well. But um, again, they, they come in a variety of particle sizes. Silicon carbide frequently will contain crystalline silica, which is a major um, problem if it's, if it's inhaled. Um, and some of the, the uh, occupational exposure limits on, uh, on crystalline silica have been reduced in recent times. And we'll mention a little bit more about that in a minute. We also use um, viscosity modifiers. Again, this is for the lapping products. We usually want to um, have a thickened product so that it will suspend the abrasive so it can be used as intended at the customer. We typically use clays. And again, they may, they may contain silicates and uh, derivatives of polyacrylic acid, which um, again, like the dispersants, tend to come as very finely divided powders that are quite difficult to to control in terms of dust management. Um, in terms of processes that we use that uh, may create dust or uh, exacerbate dust problems, uh, we don't actually do any milling. Um, so we're not grinding particles to make them even smaller than they already are. Um, the main dust release mechanism is, mechanism is probably when we take the raw material in a bag or, or a bucket and introduce it to the, the blending equipment. Careful as you as careful as we try to be, um, you know, it's, it's inevitable there's going to be some dust uh, that kicks back when, uh, when you empty the container. So we had an occupational health study in 2018, however, that did indicate that the respirable dust levels in production areas were below the OSHA PEL or the, the TLV. Nonetheless, we, we did make it an objective to reduce to the lowest level possible any dust exposure that our production crew would come in contact with. And of course, thinking about the, the end user, the customer, because they're going to take these products, the dry powdered products, and open them. And perhaps, you know, they, they may or may not be as careful as we are. They may or may not be using the correct PPE, but we wanted to reduce the risks to the end user as much as we possibly could anyway. So looking at this, this graph is probably familiar by now, but I've got millions of pounds per year manufactured and superimposed is the percentage of those pounds of the high dust surfactants that we use. So I, I just picked on the surfactants for the time being. They're one of the, actually they're one of the major issues in the, um, the, the dry powdered alkaline cleaning products that we make. So over the past five years, of course, you know, we've made more products, sold more product, but we actually around 2015, we did start to make serious inroads into the amount of uh, dust generating surfactants that were in use. So in terms of, of our strategies to try to reduce dust, of course, um, I mentioned the crystalline silica issue. Now we have um, in the past used to make various tumbling or burnishing products that actually had crystalline silica in the, as a raw material. Um, these dated back decades. Uh, but we eliminated that uh, in 2018. Uh, the owner of the company said, no more, find alternatives. So that's what we did. Um, so really the focus then has switched over more to the high dust surfactants. And as I showed the past few years, we've had pretty good success with that. Now, an obvious way to deal with um, the dust handling is if 
you know you can't get rid of the raw materials well then you need um, proper air handling or air management systems to minimize exposure to workers so the, the general production area which would be liquid blending they, they have a dust extraction facility by their tank each tank Typically, we don't see too much dust generation in those areas because the, um, the amount of dry, dry raw materials that go in the liquid products is, is limited. We have a ribbon blender for um, blending the dry products. And we did add an improved dust collector in May of last year. And we have full um, instructions on using the proper respirator or dust mask or any other PPE when handling dry chemicals. Um, Here's just a, a picture. So to the left is the, the ribbon blender itself from inside the building. And on the outside, you can see the, the, uh, the relatively new dust collection system. So the, the dust that come, the drops out of the dust collector is, is rounded up periodically. And um, our waste management company will come and collect that periodically. So we have a long-standing waste stream for, for that kind of um, waste dust. One, um, one alternative we can look at with surfactants, of course, is um, even in dry powdered products, you can use liquid surfactants. Um, a typical dry powdered formulation can probably tolerate maybe 5% liquid if you're lucky. So it gives us some flexibility. However, if liquid surfactants can't be found as offsets to the dry ones or the formulation can't tolerate any more liquid, um, we've been working with some suppliers to see if they can provide us surfactants with different particle morphology that will basically generate far less dust. So on the left, the left hand Petri dish shows the existing surfactant we're using. Uh, very fine dust, very hygroscopic. Um, I've seen myself when it gets put in the ribbon blender with the agitation, it just kind of forms a dust cloud instantaneously, not pleasant stuff to work with. The surfactant in the Petri dish on the right hand side is essentially the same stuff. It's just been um, processed but in a different way to form those tiny little, um, it's kind of like, uh, I guess, uh, vermicelli or something like that. It's um, much more user friendly and really generates no dust at all. So looking at other alternatives to, to different types of, um, of dry powders, dry chemicals, um, as far as abrasives are concerned, we actually used crushed glass to replace crystalline silica. Garnet is um, something with similar hardness, um, similar friability, and, and similar particle morphology, but uh, as you can imagine, garnet's rather expensive. And for certain industrial applications, um, it's not really viable in terms of cost more than anything else. The viscosity modifiers, uh, now you can get liquid forms, of course, of um, these various polyacrylic acid products. And to the extent that the formulation can, can tolerate it, we can use liquids instead of dry powders. The benefit too of the liquid forms of these uh, thickeners or viscosity modifiers is they're much easier to use, there's much less waste, so just better overall in terms of process efficiency. So just a few final thoughts on, on the dust reduction side of our efforts. Um, we're probably always going to need some raw materials that have the potential to generate dust. That, that may not be something we can completely eliminate, partly because the particle size morphology um, is, is really determined by the way that the, the chemicals are made. And uh, end users typically don't have much influence over uh, large, large scale uh, chemical companies production methods. Equally, alternative morphology uh, materials may be available, but there most likely would be a cost penalty. You know, if someone was going to spray dry something for you, or they were going to do something something special to change the, the size and the shape of the particles. What we can do, of course, though, is to take charge of the situation on the production side and make sure that the effect on our workers is, is minimized. So we can try looking for alternative raw materials. Um, we can ensure that we've got proper dust collection and air management systems and that the PPE is available, that the personnel are trained and that the use of the PPE is properly enforced. Um, and then of course, you know, a primary way to communicate uh, any kind of chemical or physical hazard is gonna be through up-to-date SDSs, technical data, and 
communication with customers as needed. And in some cases, I've been involved in a few of these directly myself where we've worked with the customer to come up with um, an alternative abrasive. And we've, we've talked through all of these kind of aspects, you know, face to face with the customer, not just send them, you know, a, a new product with some paperwork, which they may or may not read. We like to make sure that the message is firmly drilled home. So that really concluded the, um, the, the three main aspects of uh, kind of environmental challenges and some of the actions we've taken when it comes to formulating and manufacturing our products. The, the business challenges presented by COVID-19 have uh, impacted Madison Chemical, I'm sure as much as, as anybody else that's, that's on the call at the moment. We, um, of course, are in the chemical industry. So very early on, Homeland Security issued some communications that uh, mentioned that the chemical industry was essentially um, was, was an essential pillar of the economy. So we were, I suppose, somewhat empowered to remain open and functioning um, to the extent possible. And uh, we initially, in the very early stages, took a close look at the situation and figured it out, but decided that based on the advice coming from the CDC, that we were going to split our production operations into two distinct shifts. Previously, we operated a 5 a.m. to 5 p.m. workday. Theoretically, people would work different combinations of hours, but there was co-mingling of people uh, who would come in at different times of day, no real segregation. So we split production into two teams. The idea being that if a few people got sick, um, they could very quickly infect everybody else. Whereas with two separate teams, the hope was, you know, if there was a problem, it could at least be isolated to the one team and leave you know, people spare perhaps to, to help on the second shift or the first shift accordingly. We also um, divided up the, the support staff so that we had an EHS officer on both shifts. We had a lab chemist to assist with any kind of um, safety related questions on the chemical side, any kind of um, on the fly adjustments to products, any kind of technical support. And we had a QA te technician available also for both shifts to make sure that um, Basically, everything we would need and we would normally have would be available um, to, to the two shift supervisors. Right now, we're back to a single, a single shift. Um, we're still practicing um, social distancing. Uh, people are required to wear face masks uh, when, when they're in the building, uh, just moving around the general areas. Chemical operators may well be wearing respirators, depending on what they're doing or what they're handling. Um, so in terms of how our business operations look now, I guess it's some, I would say normal, but quote unquote, um, there, there are still some restrictions on people's movements, etc. We've engaged in remote work practices. Um, so we've done an awful lot of teams or zoom meetings with customers and indeed even for internal meetings, um, it's become remarkably convenient for us just to stay at our desk and do a video call. Um, Pre-COVID, it probably would have seemed a bit ridiculous to do that with the person in the next office or something, but it uh, just allows us to eliminate any kind of social distancing problems where you want to get more than a few people in a meeting room. Um, and as we're still distilling the lessons learned from all this, I think the impact on the business really still needs to be evaluated. Madison Chemicals in the fortunate position of being a, a vendor of sanitizing chemicals uh, lots of those are on the EPA uh, list N, which I think has become a, a topic of considerable interest for, for many people now. So we sell things like um, quaternary ammonium, surfactant sanitizers, uh, sodium hypochlorite, ferrocetic acid, um, so forth. So it's um, we have pretty much a complete range of products for anyone seeking to, to sanitize in the wake of the, the COVID problems. And um, once we've really decided on the lessons learned, maybe come up with further action items, um, our ISO 14001 system scope will definitely be updated to, con to, to include some consideration of how an epidemic or a pandemic could impact on, on a business. Typically and traditionally, I think most of the risk assessments or risks that we discussed and put in our scope would really concern major economic upheavals or perhaps weather-related problems that, that might cause physical damage to the infrastructure. 
or cause breakages in the supply chain of raw materials and or uh, delivering finished goods to customers. So I think it's a very interesting situation and uh, of course we're still in the middle of it by the looks. So just to summarize briefly here, um, I've, I think that uh, even in the time I've been with Madison, we've, we've continually developed the, the environmental management system. Now we use ISO 14001 as the, the way to round up everything that we need to do and everything we need to comply with. And I think that helps us a lot, taking into account those kind of factors when we sit down and design products and when we decide how we're going to manufacture products. Uh, it's much more than just writing down a list of chemicals on a piece of paper and saying to somebody, well, test that and see if it works. There, there's the effect on people, the environment, that definitely need to be taken into account when designing a product. Um, now, as I've mentioned, some of our recent um, environmental related improvements include reducing NPE surfactant usage, uh, up both, and that helps us and our customers. We've worked with some customers on VOC mitigation projects, and we've made significant inroads into um, dealing with uh, dust management issues, again, for our people and for our customers. And I think a major opportunity for improvement will be for us to really figure out how, how COVID is going to affect our, our business and whether that poses any kind of threats on the environmental side um, as we go through this year and into next. So that really concluded everything I had to say. Um, so if there were any questions, I'll be happy to take those. Um, Steve, uh, did you uh, formulate any uh, new product this year where you had to go through and obtain an EPA registration? Well, yeah, so what we did um, earlier in the year, we were, we were reselling somebody else's hand sanitizer. We weren't manufacturing it ourselves. So that, in that case, we, um, that, that was fairly straightforward. We were just um, you know, reselling someone else's product. Um, what we have done this year, um, because of the growing trend for sanitizing uh, businesses, might be offices, hotel rooms, um, general work areas, we, we are, yes, we have sub-registered a, um, a, a, what is called ProClean surface disinfectant. So the intention is that would be used to disinfect, you know, hard surfaces by using some kind of spray system. So that, yes, we have sub-registered one, one new product this year. Um, also, uh, with all the uh, to-do about uh, perfluorinated alkyl substances, is that very common in your industry as far as using a fluorinated carbon compound or a perfluorinated compound? Or is that no. typically found elsewhere? So typically in other industries. Um, I know there was the whole, there was like the whole PFOS thing. Uh, this would probably be before I even left the UK um, 13 or 14 years ago. Some of the surfactants that we maybe could have used in the past um, in certain applications, a fluorinated surfactant might get you the surface tension reduction you need for a particular application, but Madison doesn't use fluorinated surfactants. Um, I think we've got one that's used in extremely small quantities, but that doesn't, that's not derived from, from, from PFOS or PFOA. Um, that's just a fluorinated compound then. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a fluorinated, fluoro surfactant. But, uh, so used in very small amounts, but in very few products. I believe you mentioned parasitic acid. You sell that? Yes. Um, do you also sell any of the chlorinated products? Uh, well, we sell sodium hypochlorite, 12.5%, um, which is pretty much the standard bleach um, product on the market. Um, but that's fairly straightforward. I mean, that just arrives in a bulk. We, we have a bulk tank and we have an EPA uh, sub registration for, for that. So it's, get, it's sold under a brand name as an EPA registered product, or it can be sold as non, uh, non regulated too. But uh, as far as chlorinated materials, so that's, the, you know, that's the only one really. So my understanding is the benefit of, the, of parasitic acid is that you don't have a chlorine residual. And Correct, so yes. And so, so for yeah. a wastewater discharge, that's a ben benefit that uh, 
you won't be discharging that uh, to the wastewater system. Correct, because PAA will just break down the carbon dioxide and water, so it's about as environmentally friendly as it gets. Well, I don't know about the carbon dioxide, I guess, but it's certainly not going to um, leave a residue. Um, so I, I'm hogging the Q&A, so I, I don't mean to do that. And so certainly other people might have questions dealing with particular uh, maybe customers they have dealt with or individuals in their particular states. Well, uh, with that being said, uh, maybe there isn't any. Uh, Steve, I appreciate your uh, willingness to uh, put together this presentation and deliver it today, given okay. the uh, given the the uh, <clears throat> given all that uh, your company has gone through, and we all all have gone through in terms of trying to adapt during this unusual time that we live in with respect to COVID-19. I don't know what the future will be like, uh, but you know, it seems that we're likely to have to deal with this at least uh, perhaps sometime next year, if not further into the future. Um, so I thank you for uh, providing this presentation today. Uh, again, any, any thoughts on um, any questions? Um, if not, um, next month we have um, a call. Um, I believe Emily and another individual will be giving a talk and um, it's gonna be regarding um, Minnesota's efforts to uh, restrict or prohibit the uh, use of trichloroethylene. And so I'm definitely interested in, uh, in connecting with that. Okay. Again, thank you. And uh, I wish you well for today and Thanks. I will see you next month. Okay. Oh, one quick thing. I will send you, if you like, uh, a new PDF. I made a few tweaks or a few changes. So you may as well have the latest version if you like. Oh yeah, that would be great.